We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham d returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear, 
and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. And then we're just going to read two more verses here. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, and altogether, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Brother Rilson, would you open us in a word of prayer? Amen. Please be seated. So last time we talked about the Levitical priests. We talked about how they are taken from men and they're ordained to godly matters. They offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. They have compassion on sinners, but they also have to sacrifice for themselves. We also talked about how they, they uh, cannot be appointed. They have to come from Aaron's lineage. They have to be able to be traced back to the line of Aaron. Jesus, in contrast, though, he offered a sacrifice once for our sins, not continually. He also, he has compassion on sinners. Since he walked among us, he suffered and was tempted like us. He does not need sacrifices for himself. He is not from Aaron's line, but from the order of Melchizedek. And he is God and was ordained by God to be an intercessor for us in the true temple after he presented his body as an offering to God. We talked about all that last week. We also talked about the warnings of chapter 6 given to those Hebrews collectively that if they were to leave out of the new covenant and go back to the old covenant, there may not be a way for them to come back. I mean, if collectively they left. And that, you know, they need to value the new covenant. They need to value, place this at a higher value than they did at the old covenant, you know, because they were missing the things back in the old covenant. Um, because otherwise, you know, if they go back to the Old Covenant, they would be rendered useless for God's work. We saw that, that with the land. He talked about the land that just brought up thorns and briars. And they would be rendered effectively useless for God's work if they went back into the Old Covenant. So, last time we, we read up through ch verse 15, but I would like to just go back and start from uh, verse 11 in chapter 6. And just, just recap that. So we've got, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, that's after Abraham had patiently endured, Abraham obtained the promise. So we see here that God makes promises through covenants to 
believers. Okay? He doesn't make promises, he doesn't make covenants with unbelievers. He makes promises and covenants to believers. These are opportunities that are in addition to salvation. Abraham was already saved, but he gave Abraham additional opportunities beyond salvation to, to take part in his work. And uh, so like he did with, with Abraham, he, he gave these uh, things in addition to salvation. But these require that we act to obtain these opportunities. We need to act. We also, as it says here, need to be patient. We need to be patient in, uh, how, how did it say it? Through faith and patience, inherit the promises. So we, it says here in, in verse 15, and so after he had patiently endured, we have to patiently endure to be able to inherit the promises. He obtained the promise, it says. And so the new covenant, the New Testament church, is an opportunity for us as believers to take part in. And, but we have to act, we have to join a church, we have to be baptized, we have to participate in the church, you know, serve in the way that the Holy Spirit is leading us to serve, whatever capacity that may be, and uh, we have to patiently endure. Leaving out is not patiently enduring. Staying within the church and serving is. So now I would like to go to Psalms chapter 110. Let's go there. We're going to read through the entire chapter. It's not very long. What is it 119? Is that the one that's the longest chapter in the Bible? Yeah, we're not going to read 119. This one's only uh, seven verses, so that would be a long morning. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn, and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads of many countries, over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. So we see here in, in Psalms chapter 110, we see here that it says, the Lord hath sworn and will not repent. That, that word there for sworn, it's the word Shabbat. And that actually, does anyone know what that, that is in Hebrew? Shabbat. That actually is the number seven. It's the number seven. If you go in the Hebrew there, it's the exact same word for the number seven. That, that word has two meanings. Not only is it the number seven, but it also means to swear, to confirm by, a, yeah, by swearing, to repeat seven times. Okay, and, and it effectively uh, is about, um, kind of relays the idea of creation. And how in seven days, on the seventh day, God completed his work and he rested. Okay? Signifying he rested on that seventh day, signifying he had completed his work. And it was good, he said. And so the same idea there with that, that word, he swore and will not repent, is that he... He said it in a way that it is complete, and it will not change. It will never change. So just keep that in mind, though, as we continue on through Hebrews here, because it's going to be important. So Hebrews chapter 6, going back to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 16, it says, For men... Verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them 
an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, that's the unchanging, of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is, was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor for, of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is entered for us, is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So let me ask you something here. Verse 18, it says that by two, let's see how close with attention we are paying, that by two immutable things. So what were, go back and read through that. What were the two immutable things? Go back through and read, starting back, uh, you can start at uh, verse 16 and going on through 17. And if you, if you know what those two immutable things are, go ahead and say it. What was that? Huh? Um, read, it, read it carefully. The two things are separated by, well, actually... Each verse gives one of the two things. Well, the, and they're both given in verse 16, actually. Um, so the two things, I'll just give it to you here, is that God swore, okay? There's this idea, this concept of swore, you know, as we went through, is, you know, to repeat seven times, to say in a way that is to complete it. And, and it says here in verse 16, for men verily swear by the greater. So when God swore, he, um, he, there is no greater than God. So he had no need to swear by anyone because, you know, he is the greatest there is. So the, the first thing there is that God swore. The second thing is, is that he gave an oath, a promise. Okay, so the two immutable things. And the, if we go in the Hebrew, uh, I'm sorry, in the Greek, and we look at the words here, we see that... Um, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath uh, for them, and an, so those two things, swear by the greater, and an oath for them, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Those are the two things, okay? Swear, the word there is omnuo, okay? And that means to declare, to swear, to, to take a declaration, and then the word Oath is a different word. That's horkos. Okay? And that's to put a restraint, to put a limit, to put a fence. Okay? So he's comparing, those are the two immutable things. Okay? By the fact that God swore before he said it, and then he made a promise. Okay? For the Hebrews, this was um, something very important for them. Because it was in effect, when, when he said that in Psalms, it was as though he was just like on the seventh day, the Sabbath, you know, completing creation. It was an additional confirmation. Not that he needed to. Not that it was necessary that he, he do so. But so that we could, we might have, as it says, a strong consolation. They fled from the old covenant into the new covenant. They fled into the hope that Jesus gave, which is the new covenant. 
right? The, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that veil. So they, they left out of the old covenant, okay? And so this is a strong consolation, a promise, okay? And it's sworn by God. You know, you have in, uh, when people go to take office, I don't know in the Philippines how they do it or how in, they do it in Cambodia, but in the U.S., what they do is they take the Bible, they put it down, and then uh, the person will make an oath. They'll put their hand on the Bible. And when they finish the oath, they'll say, so help me God, okay? To say that, you know, this, so first they give their oath with their hand on the Bible, and then they swear, you know, that... Essentially, it's, it's saying, God, hold me accountable for what I have said. Okay? So that's effectively what God did so that we would have a strong consolation, so that the Hebrews would also have a strong consolation in God's promise. So what was the oath? What was that oath that God took? Okay, so, yeah, th there's a, a funny joke. So every time that so the, the pastor asks a question, you just answer, Jesus Christ, and then, you know, it's, it's usually 90% of the time it's correct, right? He's talking about the book, about the promise of because Jesus Christ is the high and he will live forever. Therefore, the... Yes. Well, yeah, and, and we just read in Psalms chapter 110 where that oath was given. And that oath, specifically that oath, is that thou art a priest after the order of a Melchizedek, forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so now we're going to go through chapter 7, and we're going to talk about just how significant that is, what that actually means. Because, you know, when you first read that, it's like, okay, I mean, if you first read that, okay, thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and we're not, we're not Jews, we, we didn't study the Old Testament, you know, growing up for, you know, a long time, so that, it just doesn't hold a lot of meaning to us. But we want to study and figure out what exactly does that mean? What exactly does that mean? To say that there is a priesthood that is separate from the Levitical priesthood, that's superior to the Levitical priesthood. Because see, none of us have ever worshiped in Judaism. We don't understand what, what, what does that Levitical priesthood really mean? And we don't have a personal connection to that, like these Hebrews did. So we're gonna go through that in chapter seven. We're gonna just see how that all connects, how that all fits together. Um, first, going through uh, verses one through three, it says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, that is Melchizedek, is king righteousness. And after that, also, king of Salem, that is Melchizedek, which is king of peace. So he has two titles there, king of righteousness, king of peace. Additionally, there's, there were additional things about him that, that the Hebrews knew that was passed down through tradition, that he was without mother, without father, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. And so we talked about last, uh, a couple of weeks ago, about how it very likely that that was Shem, and that he, um, he actually outlived Abraham. He was, his, uh, Noah and his wife had already passed away by this time. So he effectively had no parents, okay? Aside from what he told people, no one knew who his parents were at that time, okay? No one had met his parents at that time. 
So he was without father and mother, and the people revered Shem at that time because, you know, he was the only one that was still alive from the f before the flood. So he was without beginning of days because he existed before the earth was changed by the flood. And he was a, it says here, um, no end of life. During Abraham's life, Shem lived on past Abraham, about 30, 35 years past Abraham. So from Abraham's viewpoint, vantage point, Shem was, or this, this Melchizedek, was a picture, a type of Jesus Christ to show Abraham and to show us what would come later. But it's more significant than that because you, you consider this, that Abraham, okay, this is Abraham who is the father of, of all of the Israelites. He's the father of Aaron, I mean the, the great patriarch of Aaron. He was the patriarch of all the Levites. Yet, he gave a tenth of all that he had to this Melchizedek. Okay. And all the, you know, in, in Israel, all of the Hebrews, they gave a tenth of all they had to the Levites, right? To the priesthood. So if Abraham's giving a tenth of all he has to Melchizedek, what does that say about Melchizedek compared to the Levitical priesthood? It shows us that it's a, a superior priesthood. It's a better priesthood. And so we see that in verse, uh, going verse 4 through 10. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So Melchizedek, because Melchizedek blessed Abraham, therefore Melchizedek must be better than Abraham to be able to impart a blessing to him, right? And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. So because Levi is of Abraham's lineage, and Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek, therefore the, Le the Levitical priesthood paid tithes to Melchizedek, showing that Melchizedek is a superior priesthood. Let's, let's continue on here. If therefore perfection were by the political, by, by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So what, what's it saying here? If God prophesied of another priesthood, what does that mean about the Levitical priesthood? So these, this, um, these Hebrews, you know, they'd grown up in, in the uh, synagogue and they would go take um, every, every year or several times a year, they would go and visit Jerusalem and go to the, the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem. And they would see as the high priest would go in and, and then he would go into the holies of holies and then he'd come back out. Or maybe he wouldn't come back out, right? Each year the high priest would go in. And sometimes when the high priest would go in, God would strike him dead. And people feared when that happened. Sometimes he would come back out and still be alive. And so they watched as this, this took place. 
They watched as, you know, they knew priests. They had a priest in their own synagogue who they interacted with and who showed grace to them and who they were able to talk to and understand better, who taught them about God. And so, you know, the, the priests were very formal. They had a lot of formal activities that they engaged in under the law, sacrifices. And, and uh, we, we're going to go through and see just all the things that they did here in a moment. But if God in Psalms 110 said that there is another priesthood, what does that mean about the Levitical priesthood? Yeah. Yes. I like the word you use there, completed. It's not complete. The Levitical priesthood is not perfect in the sense that it's not uh, the word in the, the Greek is teleos. It's not perfect in that sense that it's not complete. Okay? Where this other priesthood is, it is complete. It is perfect. So let's go on to verse 12 through 16. Uh, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. You see, Jesus did not come from the tribe of Levi. He came from through, through the lineage of David, out of Judah, right? So, of, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest. So God had prophesied in Psalms 110 had made an oath, had sworn that there will be, that, that his Messiah will be of the order of Melchizedek, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. So just like Melchizedek had outlived Abraham, and in, in, uh, if it was Shem, you know, in Abraham's mind, this was someone who had endless days, okay? And that was a picture. Well, likewise, Jesus Christ was the first, the first man to rise again and to have eternal life, right? He was the first to rise again and have eternal life, making him the high priest of a new, of a, well, an old order, the, the order of Melchizedek, so for he testifies. Oh, so how, what, in what ways are, is Christ similar to Melchizedek? Eternal, yeah. So he's effectively, uh, well, Christ, Jesus Christ is eternal. Where Melchizedek, you know, in, in Abraham's viewpoint was eternal. Jesus Christ is truly eternal, yes? Without father, without mother, um, endless days. So because Christ rose again and has eternal life, this demonstrates he fulfills, this demonstrates to the Hebrews and to us that he fulfills the promise in Psalms 110. That is, he is of the priesthood of Melchizedek. The latter is not under the law unto death, but is under the power of eternal life, as we just read there. It's not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life, right? 
Okay, so continuing on, for he testifieth, and this is, we've, we've read several times, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. So the sacrifices and the priesthood before, it's weak, it's unprofitable, it's not complete. We now have something more complete. For the law made nothing perfect. A word there is complete, teleos. But bringing, the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. So the law, the sacrifices, the commandments given to the Jews is disannulled because it is weak and unprofitable compared to the new covenant. And it made nothing perfect. It made nothing complete. But by Christ... We can be made perfect. We can be made complete. Through whom we can go to God. Through Jesus Christ. Verse 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. So let me ask you something here. Just go back through and read that again. What was the difference declared here? What was the difference between the Levitical priests and Jesus Christ? About the oath. What's the difference there? Did Jesus Christ, was Jesus Christ uh, with an oath or without an oath? Was he made a high priest with an oath or without an oath? With an oath. Jesus Christ was made, so we've got a double negative there. We have not without, which means that it's the same as with. Okay, so Jesus Christ was made with an oath. But the priests were made without an oath. The Levitical priests were made without an oath. Well, why would that be? Let's go back. We're going to go to um, Exodus chapter 28. We've got a lot of reading to do, so Exodus chapter 28 and chapter 29. So let's begin. And here we, we uh, see where, where Moses, um, God has called Aaron to be um, the, the first priest, the first high priest. And that his lineage will be the, the priests that will attend to the altar and to the tabernacle. And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, Nadab, and... Okay, and then you can read the names, that's fine. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Now, what I want we, you guys to be looking as we read through this, I want you to look to see if there's any point at any time where Aaron and the priesthood were there to give an oath. Okay? Let's go through. We're going to read all of this and see if there's at any point or any time where they have to give an oath. Okay? We're going to watch what happens. Um, we'll see. We'll see. It's, it's very interesting to go through this because you'll, you'll see something that's, that's quite interesting. And these are the garments which they shall make. A, pre, a breastplate, an ephod, and a robe, an embroidered coat, a meter, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and of purple, of scarlet, and fine twined linen with cunning work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof. 
and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod, which is upon it, shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. And thou shalt take two onyx stones, and grave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. With, who, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in ouches of gold, and thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. Okay, I don't see any time where they're given an oath yet, right? Let's keep going. And thou shalt make ouches of gold and two chains of pure gold at the end. Of raven work shalt thou make them and fasten the wreathen chains to the ouches. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work, and after the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twine linen shalt thou make it. Four squares it shall be being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, and an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains of the ends of the wreathen work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and shalt put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put the two wreathen chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the wreathen chains Thou shalt fasten in the two ouches, and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. So we still don't have yet a, any, any oath. And thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod uh, inward. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and put, shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod, underneath toward the forward part thereof over against the other coupling thereof above the curious girdle of the ephod and they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod and Aaron shall bear upon shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth into the, unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Okay, as we, as we keep reading here, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for whether there's an oath that they give. But I wanted to, to, to have you guys focus on one more thing, okay? We know that Jesus Christ is our high priest. And as we're reading all of these things, I want you to be thinking about how these things may pertain to us you know it talks about having these um, the, the 12 tribes the, the gems on this ephod and that it's to be above the heart of the high priest you know and I, and I want you to think about that okay if, if this is just a, a picture of what Jesus Christ is now before God on our behalf whose names are written on stones above his heart. Whose names? I want you to think about that. Who he's interceding for. Who he's interceding on behalf of. Okay, so as we're reading this, I know this is going to get long and, long and drawn out, but just, I want you to, to glean some of these 
these pictures that show us the eternal about how Jesus Christ has each of us on his heart as he goes before God. How he's interceding on behalf of each of us. Okay, and so, you know, we also, one more thing I want you guys to get while we're reading this is just understand from the Hebrews' perspective how beautiful and ornate the priesthood was, the Levitical priesthood was. Something physical that they could see, okay? And they didn't, before they got the book of Hebrews, maybe they hadn't connected all of the pieces together. You know, they, they only had what was before and now. And in the new covenant, they didn't have all this ornate beauty, all of these gems, all of this, the temple and all of that, okay? So we're going to keep reading through here. We'll, we're going to focus on those three things. One, how, whether or not they give an oath. Two, how these things picture Jesus Christ in his office as high priest on our behalf. And three, how it must have been for the Hebrews to go from this type of worship with the physical things that they can see to the new covenant where Jesus Christ is in the, the true temple, but they can't see that. They can't physically with their eyes see that. Okay. And thou shalt put, verse 30, and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be an hole on the top of it in the midst thereof. It shall have a binding of woven work round about the whole of it, as it were the whole of an hab habergeon, that it be not rent. And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold between them round about a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, yeah, a golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out that he die not. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold engrave upon it like the engravings of the signet, holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the meter. Upon the forefront of the meter it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their, give, their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord." And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the meter of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needlework. And for Aaron's sons thou shalt make coats, and thou shalt make for them girdles and bonnets, shalt thou make for them, for, the, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron thy brother, and his sons with him, and shalt anoint them, and consecrate them, and sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even unto the thighs they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come in unto the tabernacle of the congregation or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto him and his seed after him. And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them to halo them to minister unto me in the priest's office. So this is how they will be haloed. This is how they'll be consecrated. Okay, Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread and cakes unleavened tempered with oil and wafers leavened anointed with oil of wheat and flour shalt thou make them. And thou shalt put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams. 
And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt wash them with water. And thou shalt take the garments and put, them, put upon Aaron the coat and the robe and the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put the meter upon his head and put the holy crown upon the meter. Then shalt thou take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. And thou shalt bring his sons and put coats upon them. And thou shalt give... Thou shalt gird them with girdles, and Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them. The priest's office shall be there for a perpetual statute. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his sons, and thou shalt cause a bullock to be brought before the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the bullock, and thou shalt kill the bullock before the Lord by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation." Thou shalt take the blood of the bullock and put it upon the horns of the altar with thy finger and pour all the oil, pour all the blood beside the bottom of the altar. And thou shalt take all the fat that covereth the inwards and the caul that is above the livered and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and burn them upon the altar. But the flesh of the bullock and his skin and his dung Thou shalt burn with fire without the camp. It is a sin offering. Thou shalt also take one ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. And thou shalt slay the ram, and thou shalt take his blood and sprinkle it round about the altar. And thou shalt cut the ram in pieces and wash the inwards of him and his legs and put them unto his pieces and unto his head, and thou shalt... Burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And thou shalt take the other ram, and Aaron and his sons shall put their hands upon the head of the ram, and then thou shalt kill the ram, and take of his blood, and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe of their right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar, and of the anointing oil, and sprinkle it upon Aaron, and upon his garments, and upon his sons, and upon the garments of his sons with him. And he shall be hallowed, and his garments, and his sons, and his son's garments with him. Also thou shalt take of the ram the fat and the rump and the fat that covereth the inwards and the call above the liver and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them and the right shoulder for it is a ram of consecration and one loaf of bread and one cake of oiled bread and one wafer out of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And thou shalt put all in the hands of Aaron and in the hands of his sons, and shalt wave for them a wave offering before the Lord. And thou shalt receive them of their hands and burn them upon the altar of the burnt, for the, a burnt offering for a sweet savor before the Lord. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And thou shalt take the breast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be thy part. And thou shalt sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering, which is waved, and which is heaved up, and of the ram of the consecration, even of that which is for Aaron, and of that which is for his sons. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons by a statute forever from the children of Israel, for it is an heave offering, and it shall be an heave offering from the children of Israel of the sacrifice of their peace offerings, even their heave offering unto the Lord. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him, to be anointed therein and to be consecrated in them. And that the son is the priest, and his stead shall put them on seven days, when he cometh into the tabernacle of the congregation to minister in the holy place. And thou shalt take the ram of the consecration, seethe his flesh in the holy place. And Aaron and his sons 
shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. And if aught of the flesh of the consecrations or of the bread main, remain unto the morning, then thou shalt burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. And thus shalt thou do unto Aaron and his sons according to all things which I have commanded thee, seven days shalt thou consecrate them. And thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for atonement, and thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made an atonement for it, and thou shalt anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever toucheth the altar shall be holy. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting out of breath here. Now, this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar two lambs of the first year day by day continually. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at even. And with the one lamb a tenth deal of flour mingled with the, flour, with the fourth part of an hin of beaten oil and the fourth part of an hin of wine for a drink offering. And the other lamb thou shalt offer at even and shalt do thereto according to the meat offering in the, the morning and according to the drink offering thereof for a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacles of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto you and to thee. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory, and I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So how were, did, did you see anywhere in there where they took an oath? Why were, the, well, okay, how were the priests, the Levitical priests, we just read through all of that, how were they consecrated? Anyone? I mean, there was a long process, but if you could just sum it up in a word or two. How were they consecrated? Sacrifices. So there was blood shed on their behalf. Why? Because they were not worthy. So they don't give an oath. Instead, they're consecrated by sacrifices and offerings because they themselves are not worthy. Okay? Yet Jesus Christ was consecrated by an oath. Why? Because he is worthy. Okay? We went through all of that to see that Jesus Christ did not was not consecrated by an oath. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 7, and we're just going to quickly finish up here. Um, so, for the priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant, or a better testament. And that word there, surety, it's uh, the same, it's effectively a, a um, pledge or an instrument, okay? That Jesus himself is a pledge or an instrument of a better covenant. He is pledged as effectively like if you were to say, okay, I'm going to take out a loan with the bank and I will work to pay it off, okay? You're pledging yourself to work to pay this loan off. Well, that's effectively Jesus is the surety of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. And it says, And they truly were many priests because they died, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. So Aaron died. The next high priest died. They all died, 
right? But Jesus, this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto him by God, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Okay? And, and a lot of this we've, we've covered already. Yes, Jesus is, is perfect. He is holy. And uh, unlike the Levitical priesthood where they were sinners, he, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice for the first for his own sins. You saw how the, the Aaron and his sons had to offer sacrifices for themselves first before they could take that lamb before Israel, right? Each year. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Okay, the word of the oath. What was that oath? The oath that God gave that thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And therefore, Jesus is consecrated, that is set aside for a holy purpose forevermore. What exactly does he do? Let's sum it all up in these next two verses here. This is what the author of Hebrews is going to do for us. He says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So we have Jesus Christ, who is next to God, who is on the right hand of God, okay, who is interceding on our behalf. We no longer need the Levitical priests. We no longer need those former things. Now, for the Hebrews, this is significant because they grew up with the, the priests. And I'm sure some of the older, he, the, some of the older um, members of this church were likely thinking back and talking among each other. You know, yeah, you remember how when we were, you know, we served in the temple, when we served, some of these may have even been priests before. How when we... Um, when we went to the synagogue, how we went to these dinners, you know, and all of the things that, they, they, that we did each year. You know, I really miss some of those things that we did back then, okay? And they're thinking back to those things, but they're not looking at the bigger picture. They're not looking at the bigger picture of what those things represented, how those represented Christ, and how Christ is now serving in the temple, the true temple, the true tabernacle in heaven on their behalf. And, and likewise, you know, we can sometimes look back at maybe our life before we got saved and before we got in the church and think, well, you know, this was nice or that was nice when I did my own thing. Sometimes we can look back and think on those things. Yet, the author here, he's, he's showing us that we have a better hope. We have a surety in Jesus Christ. We have, uh, we have something to look forward to in the future. And don't look back. Don't look back at those things because what we have in the future, the promises that we have availed to us are so much better than whatever we could have had before. Thank you.